for so many uh, time out, uh, long time to think about or meditate. And now I like to invite Mrs. Letizia van Haren, special lady. <laughs> she studied anthropology. It means other cultures, as I understood. And then non-Western cultures. And she went to sub-Saharian sub countries, Africa, and Asia, Southeast Asia, and she took care of women, of mothers, uh, officially the name is protection of children, but the children are coming through mothers. So when I read this, I thought you take, took care of mothers first, of families, fathers and mothers. Family are here work. And now the floor is yours, Mrs. Leticia Van Halen. So um, now you get me there, let us know what you did, because I just learned that many of you have read my story, so you are better informed about me than I'm about you. I'm just trying to get to know you, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. But let's start at the beginning. I want to say hello, first of all of you, and I'm really new to the, your federation, and I'm very grateful to Carolyn that she allowed me to come here. I work with her very nicely, I mean, it's more that she works with me a little because she's very busy, I'm doing other things mostly. And she, when she invited me to speak on this panel, I just said, oh well, why not, nice, because it's a pleasure with her to work in Geneva, so why not here. So, here we go, I would say, the first thing, I checked the Women's Federation for World Peace, I thought, ha, ah, these are good girls, because we are not just looking for something small and nice at home, we are aware that we have a real big thing at hand. And here in Cyprus, in the Middle East, we can feel it more than ever. It's extremely heavy on all of us, and I'm very grateful that all of you are aware that we cannot just hide from it, but we have to be aware of it. And we have to bring, contribute our little stone to making something safer and a safer place this world. Okay, then I would like to say, do we as women, especially as women leaders, have something to propose to bring peace closer? I mean, we are now, we are playing into the deconstruction of the woman. It is now, frankly, men who decide to be women who would also dictate, including in the UN, what a woman is. So I'm not a woman today, perhaps. I'm not wearing high heels. I haven't painted my nails. So I do not qualify. Please be, be aware of all that. <laughs> yeah. What can we do to make peace, to keep peace, to make it, to cultivate it, to give it depth and meaning? Yes, we, uh, we know that at the time, now, we live further removed from peace than ever since the Second World War. We really have to be aware that we are as close to it as they were before the Second World War. It's absolutely scary. So, we feel in our hearts and our whole bodies. Because I remember I grew up with the Cold War, and every day from a very little early age onwards, I was aware how extremely worried my father was. We had 11, not 11 children at once, but we had a big family that grew to be 11. How were we going to protect us when the Russians came, and then we joked, the, all the boys joked, oh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll dig a hole in the sand pit, we'll make the sandbox a little bigger, and we'll get one tin of biscuits. But to me, as a little girl who couldn't take yet, you know, jokes, and was still living in a little world, this was extremely uh, uh, scary. But it was scary, they joked to also take care of their own fears. So, what I see is, that at the moment, globally, we really badly lack a <coughs> focused mindset and culture. We just lack it. We've thrown it out of the window. The majority of children are no longer raised for softness, for kindness and humbleness, but for success, performance, strength, determination and competition. 
If they are polite, they're said by the psychologist, they're shy, too shy, they're not shy, they're too shy. Self-conscious at an ever earlier age, and not even sexually conscious. I mean, just let it sink in. The whole idea that we had with Jean Piaget, Swiss uh, educator in the previous century, who said we have the whole uh, childhood to be not aware of ourselves and let the whole world sink in. But now, it's a child of four, has already a strong personality and may not want to go to play school because some other child offended her. And now we have to go to psychotherapist to take care of it. Just think about these things, it's just crazy. So, at the very, and even, we go even further because the very idea of the innocence of children is now rejected as a concept, a construct, meant to oppress them. Like the family is a construct to oppress, even human conscience is now said to be a construct <coughs> that is meant to oppress the free person. And the free person is someone who has total and complete and eternal enjoyment of whatever whim or caprice may come up. And then we have to cultivate them. And why is that? Because our overheated, overheated economies depend on it to, make the, to keep the machine turning. We have to be in this mode that we're constantly looking for something else and something more. This is not enough and that's not enough. So let's try to be aware of that and that our children, especially the younger ones, I see the difference between my grandchildren who are now 12 and 10 and the younger ones who are even more into this, if it's possible. But it is, and I love them, it's not to say anything bad about them. <laughs> How did this worldview shift come about? It came about very rapidly. You had Nietzsche first, and it developed into the God is dead theory. You had the sexual liberation with the pill, which was a good thing in itself, but you know, every good thing can be turned into, we talked about it yesterday, perversion. Every good thing can be perverted. We are never, never safe from that possibility. You have the make love not work movement, which was great in itself, but didn't work because it also had the drugs for the happy trips, but also they're sent into hell, I would say. We had at the same time very fast growing prosperity, and we had the media, especially television and movies, to be ever more accessible to all, with getting more and more influence. And they all conspired to create a new man and a new woman, as communism has never been able to do, because they had these powerful media. So, the human beings became self-conscious at an ever earlier age. In radical circles, the very idea of innocence of children was rejected as a construct, as I said. So, uh, you know, in uh, 2010, there were a few terrible cases of children who had committed suicide, who were barely in their teens in, in France. And of course, it solicited a lot of international uh, public debate, Ooh, if there's five minutes left. I will read something to you. And that public debate, the parents were asked, what do you, uh, what would you do if, what would you choose? They were pressed to say, in fact, that they'd rather have a child that was a bully than to have a child that was bullied. And, and the parents, of course, that was shocking because we just had two suicides of young children because they were bullied. Yet the parents, it was tactfully done, but they, they were honest. They said, yeah, I still prefer my child to be a bully. They were more comfortable at reining in an excess of assertiveness than to have to push a, a, a very easygoing, uh, passive child into more aggression. And they felt that they could handle that better. At the same time, they were fully aware that this is the problem that we see, that we push our kids to be ever more assertive, or competitive, or foreign, etc. But the parents could not bring themselves to go to the point that they would sacrifice, as it were, their own child with what they consider nowadays an excess of kindness and gentleness in a world that was getting tougher and tougher. I mean, it is a dilemma. I cannot be angry with them. I understand that it's difficult. I made different choices, but my daughters were not always happy with them. 
because I felt I had not been toughened up enough. That's true. I just wanted, because I saw the five minute sign, I will not say any of all the things that I would have liked to tell you. <laughs> but I will tell you what two young men from Africa told me with whom I work. One is a Nigerian developer, and Nigeria is the country that we associate with most fantastic schemes for deceit. This young man, I mean, yes, it, it's not a joke, it's true. it's true. In Europe, we've had a delegation of Nigerians coming to the UK, presenting themselves as the Minister of, uh, of Economics that was expected, and they got a full display of everything. But then later, people discovered they were not the real ones. Just <laughs> the time. <laughs> but it's also a fantastic country with a fantastic development, with the most incredible people. It's just a huge, huge country. So this young man, uh, when I heard that I was going to do this assignment, he said he was going to write me something that I could share with you. And I think you will be deeply moved because it will very much fit with your uh, worldview as well. He said, when I think about peace, my mind drifts to Imam Abu Bakr. For those who do not know him, Imam Abu Bakr is the cleric of a mosque in Gar, a community in the lady area of Plateau, somewhere in West Africa. He became a hero when he opened the doors of his house in the mosque he leads as a safe place to 262 fleeing Christians who were running from Islamic gunmen who invited who invaded the village on bikes and on foot. They had shot, butchered, and burned 84 people on their way to Imam Abu Bakr's mosque. The gunman got to Abu Bakr's abode and ordered him to release the Christians he had kept in his house and the mosque for him to shoot them, butcher them, and burn them. He refused asking them to kill him in their stead. This singular action saved all those who ran to him. This is a true story, huh? However, this article is not about Imam Abu Bakr or the violence in Barking Lad, Plateau State. It's about the women behind Imam Abu Bakr. His mother and his wives, although they may not have enjoyed all the buzz and attention, they have all contributed immensely to the person Imam Abu Bakr became today. His mother contributed by imbibing him with a healthy level of acceptance and tolerance for other faiths to make him see that a Christian is inseparable from collective humanity. His wives stood in support of his decision to make peace, even when their lives and that of their household was in the line of fire. It takes a lot to make a decent man. Women make men, and men make peace or war. That's what he wrote me. He also said, we never met a person, and we only work online. And he also said to me, Nigeria is a dog-eats-dog society. And then we agreed, let us work together to make it a dog-feeds-dog society. We can do that too. And he also said, I have decided to be a good person. It's a decision I make every day. I'm sure that his parents have given him a good education a good foundation and to develop it. If men do not make that decision to be decent, there is no room for women and nor for children as their equals. And there is no room for peace because then we also we all have to live in fear or go to war against men the whole time. That is too tiresome to concentrate. Yeah. And I will only tell you what my other contact in Congo said within it's zero minutes. He said that <laughs> The, the gender, the women have to have access to education. We have seen in Liberia, we have seen how the women organized an action. They stopped civil war because they suffered immensely from it. They had uh, Sir Alan, Sir, uh, Sir Alan, what was the name? J yeah. Alan Johnson there. She has given, she has improved the constitutional position of women. Even if the country is not perfect, it was really the women who made that solution. So he said, really, we have to have equality, they have to have education. They are good contributions. Peace comes from the women. Thank you. Thank you.